as probably the most vulnerable group for climate change in the entire world. I don't know how much of you all were following the Copenhagen, Copenhagen debates on Cancun, etc. And all the developed countries like the states where Algo is from are lobbying for two degrees Celsius rise in carbon dioxide, possibly 1.5. But for us in the Caribbean, 1.5 degrees Celsius over the next 100 years basically is a death sentence. Um, there was a study done in 2008 by Tufts University that said 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2100 is going to cause the Caribbean to use 21.7% of their GDP to fight climate change effects. Of course, that's just a mean, that's just an average. Places like Grenada would use 111% of their GDP to fight climate change effects. Haiti is going to use over 150% of their GDP. What that basically means is they have no money. They're going to use all their money to, to fight climate change effects, and then what? Haiti is already battling several natural disasters all at once, health, earthquakes. And in 100 years now, when we have grandkids, possibly great grandkids, what are they going to do? They're going to spend all their money on fighting sea level rise, fight, fighting forest degradation, then what? And as doom and gloom as that might seem, as morbid as that might seem, climate change, like anything else, is a change. And I'm glad to be here where they are talking about pushing your boundaries and dealing with change. As Larry Joseph said, you know, he was left as a child, he was an orphan, and he had to fight against that to reach where he is now. Same thing as us. We can either just be morbid and say, okay, fine, we're going to lose all our coast, 35% of our coastal landmass is going to be lost by 2050, 2100, depending on what rising carbon dioxide we have. Or we can look at it as a catalyst to stimulate innovation and stimulate change in how we think and all our paradigms. One of the most important thing, things that I think we can look at climate change as being a catalyst for is our economy. I'm glad to come after Stephen Taylor talking about the need for innovation. All our Caribbean countries basically are modeled after another UWE graduate, Lloyd Best and Carrie Levitt, the plantation type economy, which means basically you have one main source of income, well back in those days it was sugar, now we have tourism and oil, still plantation economy. And now we depend on a foreign market buying our goods and shipping it off. So when Barbados loses most of its coastline and its tourism, then what? When Haiti has to spend over 150% of its GDP in fighting coastal sea level rise, in, in fighting health, in fighting degradation of its already degraded forests, then what? When Trinidad, who, if you don't even look at climate change, in 40 years uses all its oil and natural gas, then what? What are we going to market and ship off then? We don't know. So what climate change should be, apart from being a matter of global consequence, should be a catalyst. Because now it's time for us to realize we cannot go on living, buying, shopping, eating, destroying, and, and basically living as if, as if all our resources are infinite, which, is, which it's not. What is infinite, though, is knowledge and the generation of knowledge. And that's where the transition to what they are now calling a knowledge-based economy is a direction in which Caribbean economies, especially Trinidad and Tobago, should direct its attention towards. I'm glad Stephen, Stephen Taylor brought that up. Because what a knowledge economy is now is something that's sustainable beyond something like a natural resource. The generation of knowledge is something that's infinite. It's something that can always be marketed because there's always need for innovative thinking, innovative ideas, knowledge, patterns, intellectual property rights, etc. What we can do, even though we are going to be the most vulnerable, the most severely hit by climate change, that's actually possibly a good thing because it puts us on the front lines of climate change. It makes us the first people to be hit or to be affected. What that means is that now we have a leg up on the competition in developing strategies, technology, 
adapting technology, and thinking based on, how, based on adapting to climate change. If we can successfully do that well in 50 years, when there's a much more urgent need for that sort of thinking, then we have the knowledge, we have the patents, we have the intellectual property rights. We don't want what happened to the steel plant to happen to us. We don't want to lose our patents for, for our paradigms. So there's a need to start thinking about climate change as a catalyst for positive growth. We are going to be the most severely hit and possibly the first hit. So then what? We look towards the future and to say, OK, we will not have any oil and gas, possibly no coast to build 25-story hotels and go deep sea diving to look at corals, then what? We spend in the region 0.001 of our GDP on innovation, research, and development. Developing, developed countries or rapidly developed countries spend between 3 to 5% of their GDP. And as Stephen Taylor showed before, there's no way we can hope to achieve that level if we stay how we are now. So the, we can look at climate change basically not as a threat, which it is, but as a way to stimulate our economy to be more sustainable. The other difficult aspect of it, like Joshua mentioned, is the constant skepticism, the denial, the basically disbelief and the credibility of climate change. And that's where the whole idea of creativity comes in. We need to get this message out. We need to let people understand even if you don't believe in climate change, you have to understand that things are changing. I mean, we look up at Northern Range from UE last year, and every night, the entire thing's on fire. Two drops of rainfall, and the entire of Port of Spain floods. Something is changing in our biophysical and natural systems. And even if you don't want to believe the, what some people call the climate change agenda, you have to appreciate and be aware of the changes that are happening now and the changes that are going to happen later on, be it physical, be it biological, be it economic, be it social. And we have to start preparing for that from now. And this is where the humanities and the creative arts, the literature and the culture comes in. Because scientists, they make graphs, nice graphs, some, some of them move. You have algo, it is nice PowerPoints and whatnot. But what they don't do is convey to the man on the street the problems that he will need to deal with and his, his generations after him will need to deal with. And that's where you have stuff like you we speak. That's where you have music, soca, you have literature. You need to, we need to start using these things to convey more than jump and wave. We need to use these things to convey more than the guild, not doing this for us and the government not doing this for us. We need to start using it to stimulate a change in people's paradigms. Because that's the only way people really understand things. Not through graphs and, and PowerPoints and figures, but through what they're accustomed with, through their culture, their expressions of culture, and song, dance, and what they read. And that has been a huge problem, especially in the Caribbean. The whole debate on climate change and its effects has been purely academic to a large extent. What we need to do now is keep in with the whole idea of sustainable development, where everything is interconnected, to start using more than just science and graphs and PowerPoints to get messages across. About climate change, yes, but also about the loss of biodiversity, the <laughs> serious econo economic changes that are happening globally, and other things like social issues, demographic issues, rather than relegating it to holes of UE or other universities and saying, okay, that's an academic problem, because it's not. If you take something like climate change, which many people look at as being this abstract issue, it's a global thing. Yes, the polar bears have to now swim from ice sheet to ice sheet. You know, you have huge floods in, in Australia, okay, fine, that's cool. But when you look at the amount of people in the Caribbean where we all live, 
that depend on things that are so interconnected to our climate and our natural system, and the loss of GDP and their poverty levels in about 50 years, then we have to understand that we need to push beyond this general inertia that sometimes Trinidadians and the Caribbean are famous for. We, we like being comfortable. We have our tourism and we have our festivals and culture and that's it. But that can't go on. It, it just literally can't go on. And uh, if there's anything that I can leave after this entire talk is that, yes, climate change, like all these other global issues, is sometimes scary to think about. Sometimes it's impossible to think about because it's so abstract and so global and so large. But all these things are interconnected. Climate change will not just affect the coast or the, the level of the water in Maracas. It will affect how much a single mother up in the hills of Laventy pays for food for her child or children or grandchildren 50 years from now. It will affect the amount of incidence of dengue 50 years from now. It would affect the amount, it would actually affect if we still exist. If you have to spend 150% of your GDP on fighting climate change, while also losing almost 40% of your coast where most people in the Caribbean live, you cannot sustain your country economically where you, where you are physically located, and you can't live in your country, then what? There's this new debate about statelessness. If a country doesn't have a physical space in which to live, what happens then? Our, our address is going to be University of the West Indies, Caracas, Venezuela. I, I don't know. So we have to start looking at these things and seeing how they relate to our life and our very existence in the Caribbean. It's not just a global abstract thing. It affects everything that we do, and it will affect our entire life 50 to 100 years from now. And we need to start preparing from today to tackle those issues. So thank you. <laughs>